Any moment can be your miracle moment. You don't know what the next 24 hours hold for you, and it just may very well contain the miracle for which you've been praying. Hello, I'm David Diga Hernandez, and welcome to Spirit Church. Today, I'm talking about experiencing the miraculous and what to do when you need a miracle from the Lord. We're gonna get into that lesson, but first, with me as usual, Stephen Moctezuma is here to do some worship. We're gonna enjoy that worship music, worship along, seek the Lord, find the presence of the Holy Spirit, and then come back and enjoy this message. Stephen Moctezuma takes it away. you found yourself in a difficult place and asking the Lord for a miraculous touch on your life, then I believe that not only are you going to find that this message resonates with you on a deep level, but I believe that this is going to help to specify and help you think clearly about experiencing the miraculous. So maybe right now as you're watching this video, you're experiencing a very difficult and trying time. You're struggling in your finances, in your relationships, in your ministry, in your business, in your family, in your mind, in your emotions. Maybe you're sick in body and you're believing God for a healing. Whatever the case may be, I believe that any moment can be your miracle moment. So often we expect tragedy and terrible things to happen. And if we're not careful, we develop this negative mindset that tells us that we should expect the worst to happen to us. Um, good things, we imagine, are what happen to other people in other parts of the world, in, from other lifestyles, from other upbringings. And we find it difficult to accept that God wants to bless us too. God wants to touch our lives too. 
especially in these times. I'm telling you, these are very interesting times in which we're living. We're talking about the rise of a terrorist group. We're talking about political unrest. We're talking about economic instability. We're talking about social issues that threaten to turn the nation upside down. And whether or not it turns out to be just hype or whether or not it is actually a threat, I believe that no matter what you're facing, no matter the season, no matter the climate, that God wants to bless your life. God wants to touch you. God wants to bring you out of the dark places. You know, in, in all throughout the scripture, we learn that the people of God are somewhat immune to the things that are happening outside of the world. So you look at maybe, for example, the people under the leadership of Joseph and Pharaoh. And when they were under godly leadership, they thrived even in a time of famine. And I believe that the same principle applies to you. But I'm saying this to encourage you because I want to get you thinking in faith. We're going to get into the lesson right now, but I want to talk to you. I want to grab your attention and I want to focus in on your need. And I want you to really start to imagine and think and meditate on the reality that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even imagine. That's what the Bible says. So instead of expecting a tragedy, which has the power to turn things for the worst, Expect a miracle, which has the same sudden effect, but instead changes things for the better. As I said at the top of the program, you have no idea what the next 24 hours hold for you. It very well may be that you're just a few hours away from breakthrough. It may very well be that by the end of this week, you're going to find the breakthrough for which you've been praying. It may very well be that just two months, three months, one month around the corner, is the place of the promised land. And perhaps you've been discouraged. Perhaps you're growing tired of the cliches and the rhetoric and wondering, okay, I've been declaring these things. I've been standing in faith. I've been looking to Jesus. I've been praying. But when am I actually going to see the promises of God materialize in my life? Well, I'm going to show you in Scripture, really there, these, uh, receiving a miracle isn't necessarily just about a moment. Because the moment of the miracle or the miracle moment is found only after the journey of faith. The problem is we want to skip ahead and we want to see the miracle moment right here, right now, without having been processed in the journey. The scripture teaches us that the Holy Spirit will not lay something that is weighted upon those who are unable to stand under its pressure. God wants to process you through the seasons of faithfulness so that you can handle the blessing. And so we're going to go to the scripture now. In number one here, I want to look at this. The first, as it has to do with receiving your miracle, is we have to hear in faith. Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear. And so most want to start receiving. Right off the bat, we want to put our spiritual hands out and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready to receive. Instead of putting our spiritual ears out, which help to bring in the faith, that process us to become one who can receive and handle what God has blessed us with. So Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it's a scripture I often quote, and it says this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is the ability to receive all that God has for you. If you don't have faith, you cannot receive what God has promised. Every promise of God, Everything that is provided in Scripture, all of the truth that can apply to our lives, all of the truth that can set us free, does us no good if we don't have faith. It may as well be as if God never promised anything if you don't have faith. For if you don't have faith, what good are the promises of God? If you don't have faith, what good are the blessings of God? If you don't have faith, what good is the truth of the Word if you don't have faith. When you don't have faith, you cannot receive all that God wants to give you. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I remember when I first got into the ministry, there was a man I would watch minister, and he was a man who would, it was the first time I ever saw anybody operating in the Word of Knowledge and the gift of healing. And so I'm sitting in the church service, I'm about 11 years old, I'm watching I mean, and you know, I often talk about this time in my life. That was the foundation being built in my life. And many of you have seasons in your life like this to where you can look back and you can see that God did a tremendous work 
during a certain period of time in your life. And this is what it was like for me at around the age of 11 is when I got saved. But I'm sitting in a church service and I'm watching this evangelist preach. And he's just walking down the aisles back and forth. And he looks at this woman. He goes, ma'am, you're sick in your body. She goes, no, I'm not. He goes, yeah, something's wrong with your jaw. And then it clicked for her. She goes, oh, yeah, actually, I had sir. And she starts to explain what happened. But there was no swelling. There was nothing visible there that was able to give away the fact that she had some problem with her jaw. It was only by the Holy Spirit that this evangelist knew that. So the woman gets healed. He calls out another person. He says, there's a, there's a tumor that's growing in this part of your body. Again, there were no signs that would have given that away. So this man is walking around the church building. There's about 100 people there. And he's calling out different people and able to see the different diseases in their body. And he's calling them out. The people are weeping and they're getting healed right in front of everybody. So I'm watching this guy and I said, Lord, I want to be used like that in the ministry. Fast forward a couple years later, I'm now sitting at lunch with this same evangelist who had one of the ones that God used to inspire me to go into ministry. And I'm watching and I'm, I'm listening and I'm talking and I'm questioning and I'm sitting there at the lunch and I'm trying to receive everything that this man of God has to give. And I asked him if there's one thing you would tell me as a young man growing up, someone who feels called to be in the evangelistic healing ministry, tell me what that would be. And he didn't even skip a beat. It was as if he had been asked that question several times before. He tells me, if you want to see miracles, he said, read the book of Acts, a good portion of it, every single day. He says, whatever your reading plan, make sure you read a chapter or two from the book of Acts. He said, you should be completing the book of Acts every week. And I, I went and I took his advice and I started to read the book of Acts. And something happened when I read the stories of how the Holy Spirit so powerfully used the apostles in the miraculous. Something happened to me because I was hearing the word. I was hearing the truth. I was hearing of the miracles. When you remember what God has done for you before, or if you remember what God has done for someone else before, then you yourself are prepared in faith to again receive what God wants to do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you have to mind your surroundings then. Guard yourself against talk of doubt. Guard yourself against cynicism and skepticism. Remember that when Jesus went to pray for the little girl, Jairus' daughter, that when he arrived on scene and said, don't be afraid, don't be sad, she's only sleeping, and everybody laughed at him, he immediately put the doubters out of the house. Jesus separated himself from doubt, and we must do the same. So number one, the first key to receiving a miracle is you have to start hearing in faith. Hear in faith. Have the spiritual ears to hear what God is saying. Number two, you have to think in faith. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says this, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7. Now, the mind is both a root and a battlefield. The mind is the root of your actions, of your behavior, of your character, of your demeanor, of everything that you affect, change, and influence. It is the root. The mind is also the battlefield. It is the place where you struggle to lay hold of the promises of God. It is the place where you struggle to think and act in faith. It is the struggle that takes place in the mind, and it's called the spiritual warfare. This spiritual battle takes place internally. We often imagine that when demonic beings or when outer influences that are of hellish influence attack, that it will come from some exterior force or some mysterious force or some spooky or creepy or eerie force. And we have this mentality because of possibly what Hollywood has influenced many people to believe, that demonic attack comes in strangely manifested ways. Now, don't get me wrong. Often demonic assault is manifested in very bizarre manners. But for the most part, demonic beings hide in the mundane and the everyday. They hide in your everyday life, and they work to influence your mind. They cannot read your mind, but they can influence your mind. And so we have to be careful to not allow in the thoughts that come into our mind that are negative, that are not what God has taught us. I mean, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 gives us a whole list on things upon which we should meditate. The scripture also talks about in Romans, about how we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. It begins in the mind. And see, this is the problem that many people have. When they're trying to receive a miracle, 
They try to change their circumstances instead of their internal thinking. The problem is, if you change your outer circumstances before you transform your thinking, then your circumstances will eventually default to how you think. I'll give you an example. I've shared this story before. But years ago, I was watching this documentary with my dad. And you know me. I've often shared about how I watch different documentaries. If I'm on Netflix, I'm going to watch a documentary most likely. So I sometimes watch medical documentaries, sometimes watch prison documentaries, sometimes watch biological documentaries, nature documentaries, all these different things. And so I was watching this one. It was like a social experiment where they gave this homeless man $100,000 in cash. They gave it to him in a briefcase, $100,000 in cash. And I was like, what I could do with $100,000 for the kingdom of God, and they're giving it to this guy. I'm telling you, I watched that documentary, and it pained me to see this homeless man, instead of bettering his circumstance, he continued to blame everybody else as to why he couldn't do good with his money. He became angrier than he was before. He wasted it on dinners. He wasted, he bought someone a car. I mean, I mean, I was just watching this and I was going, I cannot believe what this guy is doing. And so this man who had attained a blessing lost it instead of stewarding it into multiplication. And he lost it because he never had his mind changed. That's why most people who win the lotto go broke. It's because they're not ready to receive and handle. Usually when you make your money that way, when you make your finance and when you work for it, you appreciate it and you steward it and you protect it and you invest it because over a period of time, the wealth came as you transformed your mind, as you learned, as you built your character. But for this man, he was not ready to receive the blessing because his mind was not transformed. So we often wanna skip ahead to where we see ourselves. We imagine this ideal circumstance, this ideal future to where everything appears just as we want it to somewhere off in the distant future. And we hope that we're gonna make a jump from here to there. But let me tell you something, you're never going to jump from there here to there. You have to take steps little by little from here to there. And it comes first by thinking in faith. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse five, teaches us to cast down imaginations and tear down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, anything that contradicts the scripture, anything that contradicts the word of God, we have to grab hold of those thoughts, tear them down, and reject them from outside the mind. So people who think in doubt or think in cynicism or think in negativity often speak the same. But you have to be one who protects it. When the enemy rushes in your mind and throws at you a thought that says you're never going to get there, you're never going to make it, you have to immediately fight back, reject the thought, and replace it with the truth of the Word of God. Number one, you have to hear in faith. Number two, you have to think in faith. Number three, you have to see in faith. There's a very interesting story with the prophet Elisha. After he had angered a king, he and his servant watched as an army came and surrounded them. So the scripture says in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14 through 17, So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Verse 17, then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. If you could have your eyes unveiled and you could see into the spiritual realm in the same way that you see in the natural realm, you would be amazed, possibly surprised to find that there are more with you than against you. When you start to think in faith, when you hear in faith, the word gets in you, transforms your mind, and you start to think in faith. When you start to think in faith, you start to see in faith. And when situations 
and negative circumstances and unfortunate mishappenings occur in your life, you will begin to see that it can work together for your good. I don't know how many times something negative has happened to me or something that I perceive to be negative has happened to me and then I later found that it was actually positioning me to have me exactly where God wanted me to be. I mean, I think of, I think of the dreamer, Joseph the dreamer, and how he was thrown into a pit and then he got promoted somehow to be in Potiphar's house. That looked like a promotion in the spirit, and it was. But then he went from Potiphar's house to finding himself in the prison, and that looked like a demotion in the natural. But it was a promotion in the spirit. Many times, things happen in our lives that may look like setbacks, but are not setbacks. They are setups from God to position us exactly where he wants us to be. And if you're going to experience the miraculous, if you're going to see God move on your behalf, then you have to learn to see in faith. Look with the eyes of faith upon your circumstances. Look with the eyes of faith upon your loved ones. Look with the eyes of faith upon your relationships, your ministry, your business, your family, your emotions, your mind, your thought life. Look upon faith at your surroundings. And begin to see as God sees. What may to you appear destructive is actually constructive in the spirit. What may to you look like demotion is actually promotion. And God is setting you up. I'm telling you right now, God is setting up. The scripture says that he directs the steps of the godly. If you're living a godly life, you're obeying the Lord, you're seeking his face on a daily basis, you can't go wrong. No matter what comes your way, no matter how tragic it may seem, no matter how deeply it may hurt you, there are things that will position you ultimately for the miracle. So number one, we have to hear in faith. Number two, we have to think in faith. Number three, we have to see in faith. Number four, we have to declare in faith. You hear in faith the word, and when you hear with your spiritual ears, the spirit affects the mind, the mind affects how you see and when you see what God wants you to see you begin to declare what God wants you to declare the scripture says in Romans chapter 4 verse 17 as it is written I have made thee a father of many nations before him who he before him whom he believed even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were this is a famous scripture calling things that are not as though they are. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You were created in the image of God. God, your Father, has the power to speak things into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But what does the scripture say in John 1, 1? In the beginning was the word, the declaration, the proclamation, the breath, the son. And when he spoke, things happened. Do you realize that though you are not as powerful as God, I would never teach that anyone is as powerful as God, otherwise he wouldn't be God. You still possess things that are like unto his nature. Now, to what and how this actually plays out and to how our power of declaration compares to God, I don't know. The Bible isn't clear on exactly what the limitations are on our declaration. But the truth is that there is power in our declaration. There is power in what we speak. Now, what those limitations are, how far that goes, what it can create, I've not committed myself to study in any great depth yet. And I look forward to doing that one day. But for right now, I just want to point out to you that there is power in your declaration. And you, like on your, unto your Father, when you speak and when you declare, are causing things that are not as though they are. Your words are both indicators and creators. I'll say that again. Your words are both indicators and creators. They indicate what is going on in your mind and in your heart. They help you to measure and judge what happens in you internally. And they create, they change your circumstance 
externally. So they indicate what your inner nature is. They create what your outer reality may be. When you speak, you're creating. When you speak, you're establishing a dominion. When you speak, you're declaring a proclamation that is divinely backed with heaven's authority and empowers your words to change things around you. There is power in it. You cannot read the scripture. You cannot read the Bible and come to the conclusion that words do not have power. I mean, the, the words of Jesus, the words of the apostles, the words of the prophets, there is great power on speech. It's as if words take what's in us and manifest it without us. So when we take what's within a thought and we speak it in a word, we're creating something. We're changing, we're affecting the outer realm. Now, I know not everyone believes this, but this is what the Bible says. And so I believe that because words are both in informational indicators and powerful creators, we must be careful to make sure that what we declare aligns with what we have. Now, I've, I've seen this taken to the extreme. I shared last week about a woman who was in a prayer line for healing but didn't want to say what her sickness was because she was afraid that it was professing it. I'm not talking about getting superstitious. I'm not talking about going overboard or being super... Um, you know, paranoid as to what, oh, I spoke it into existence. No, I'm simply saying that we need to become in the habit of speaking what God says instead of what we say. We need to become in the habit of declaring the truth instead of declaring what the demonic voices whisper to us to try to discourage us. So, number one, we hear in faith. Number two, we think in faith. Number three, we see in faith. Number four, we declare in faith. Number five, this one's powerful, and I think it's the most powerful. Number five, we step in faith. This is obedience. John chapter 15 verse 7 says this, But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask me for anything you want and it will be granted. You know, I'm going to read it again. But when I read this right now, I want you to really pay attention to what's being said here. Think about the implications of what Jesus is saying. Whoever the scripture talks about has the power to take from the scripture and apply it to their lives. God is no respected person who ever declares these truths. Jesus is saying this openly. Let's read it again. John 15, 7. But if you remain in me, if, that's a condition. The condition is if you remain in me. Okay. First of all, I want to know what that means because what follows is so powerful that to not understand what remain in me means would be to miss out on what God wants to do. So there's the condition, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, think about that, that's both the hearing and the declaration, and my words remain in you, look at what follows. You may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. That's powerful. Think about what he's saying. This is Jesus talking. This is our Lord, our Savior, our Master, the one we claim to follow. And he's telling you, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, you can ask for whatever you want and it's going to be granted. Now, some people want to bring up, you know, uh, possible disqualifiers to that phrase but really in principle they all fall flat so for example to say well what if they want what if they want to murder someone will god allow them to do that well no because someone who has who is remaining in christ and has the word remaining in him is not going to ask for something that would break god's will neither is he going to ask for something that would be outside of human nature because that breaks God's will. For example, people say, I mean, even something as elementary as a children's church type question, well, could I ask God if I could fly? Well, no. We understand that it's not God's will for man to fly physically on his own because he created him with intent. He designed him with intent. And if God wanted him to do that, he would have given him wings. So to even ask something like that is to ask outside the will of God, outside the design, outside the construction of what God has put the order in the universe, and therefore contradictory to something someone would ask who has the word in him. So someone who has the word in them is going to ask according to God's will. So, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask me anything you want and it will be granted. The scripture also says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. 
You know why God can give the desires of the heart to someone who delights in Him? Because someone who delights in Him is not going to have ungodly desires of the heart. They're going to desire Him. So let's read on now. So what does this mean? What does remain in me or abide in me mean? Well, the answer is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. This is powerful. Here's the answer. Whoever keeps His commandments remains in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that He remains in us by the Spirit He has given us. Whoever keeps His commandments. So let's follow this logically. If we keep the commands of God, we walk in obedience, then we remain in Him, His Word remains in us, then you can ask anything. And it will be granted. You know that disobedience will hinder your prayer life? It does you no good to pray if you're walking in disobedience. If you're walking in disobedience and asking God for things, you can be sure that you will not receive that which you've asked for. Obedience is to remain in God. Obedience is to follow His Word. Obedience is to abide in Him. And if you obey His commandments... Then you can ask anything, the scripture. Think about that. You can ask anything. So before you can receive in faith, you have to hear in faith. You have to think in faith. You have to see in faith, declare in faith, and step in faith. You have to obey. The scripture also says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 through 22, and it says it in a much more pointed fashion. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. Why? Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. If you want to go to the next level. You want to receive the miraculous. You want to walk in the power of God. You want to see God bless your life. You want to see the favor of God on your life. You need to obey Him. I'm telling you, this, this applies to everyone across the board. If you are not obeying God, it will hinder your prayers. It will hinder you from experiencing the miraculous. You need to come out of disobedience and step in faith in His Word. Number six, ask in faith. After you step in faith, only then can you ask in faith. John chapter 14, verse 14 says, Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his way. So when you ask God, you have to believe that He's going to do what you're asking. Now remember, someone who is stepping in faith, thinking in faith, hearing in faith, seeing in faith, declaring in faith, is not going to ask for something outside of His will. So all those silly accusations from skeptics who say, well, can you ask this and can you ask that, or that's illogical, or why doesn't God answer this prayer? Here's why. Because He has to ask according to His will if He's going to receive. The believer must approach in faith if he's going to get anything from God. And he must be convinced and sold on the Word. This is why so many are sick. This is why so many live in breakthrough or, uh, lack. This is why so many go without their breakthrough. It's because they come to the Word of God, they read what it says, and they go, well, maybe this is for me. Well, maybe I can get blessed. Well, maybe God wants to give me breakthrough. Well, maybe God will heal me. Well, maybe God will save my loved ones. Let me tell you something. That maybe, that thinking of what well, possibly me or could be me or maybe one day, that type of thinking is what's preventing you from receiving. That type of thinking is what's keeping you from experiencing the miraculous power of God in your life. It's double-mindedness. Has He called you? Yes or no? Has He promised to take care of you? Yes or no? Has He promised to heal you? Yes or no? Has He promised to save your family? Yes or no? It is absolute. There is no wavering. Either you believe it or you don't. That's the truth. Either you believe the Word of God and you stand boldly and declare, 
or you believe what your circumstances tell you, or you believe what your emotions tell you, or you believe what your skeptical friends tell you, or you believe what your unbelieving family tells you, or you believe what all of the life situations that have created around you tell you. You have to believe the Word of God. When you ask, ask in faith, ask expecting, ask desiring, and knowing that He is able to perform that which He has promised. Don't waver. Don't get tossed to and fro. You stand for a week and you declare and you declare. And after a week, nothing happens. You go back to being discouraged and wonder why the miracle doesn't happen. It's because you need to be faithful. You need to be sold on the word of God. We need to be sold on the gospel. We need to be sold on Jesus, on the power of the Holy Spirit. Either we believe this or we don't. Either we are committed or we are not. We must stand firm on the word of God. And believe it audaciously in the face of everything that tells us otherwise. I stand on the word of God and nothing can shake my firm footing on the sure foundation of every word that he has promised. That is the mindset that receives the miraculous. Ask in faith, believing. Know that he can do it. Know that not only is he able, but he's willing. Ask in faith. And finally, number seven, when you hear in faith, think in faith, see in faith, declare in faith, step in faith, and ask in faith, you can finally receive in faith. Mark chapter 11, verse 24, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. That's it. Jesus promised. I don't care what theologians say. I don't care what critics say. I only care what Jesus says. And he said, if you will stand in faith and believe, you'll receive. That's all he's asking. You say, well, well, how do I receive? Only believe. Only believe. Nothing is impossible with God. Either we believe in what he's promised or we don't. And today, believer, I want to encourage you. Your breakthrough is on the way. Your miracle is on the way. You're stepping into something tremendous and you don't even know it. Your years of faithfulness are about to pay off. God is about to breathe on your situation. Hang on just a little longer and experience the miraculous power of God. I want to pray for you now. Let's believe that the word of God that was preached is going to take root in your heart and that you're going to receive something from it, a harvest that is birthed in faith. Come on, stretch your hands toward mine. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's now flowing. I pray, Father, you touch that one watching who's believing for healing, who's believing for breakthrough. Father, we know that you're the miracle worker. And we approach you now, reverently but boldly, full of faith believing. We trust you. We trust your word. Lord, let the miracle be done. I join my faith. I feel the power of God flowing here right now. Some of you are feeling like a, a heat on your hands as we're praying. That's the power of God. Um, some of you are feeling like electricity moving up and down your body. Um, there's different sensations. Some of you don't feel any physical sensations, but you sense something changing in the room. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you. Somebody, um, a problem with, it's around the eye. It's not the actual, I think this is an infection right around this area. God's healing you right now. I thank you, Lord, for that in Jesus' name. Uh, somebody with a knee injury has just been healed. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Father, that your miracle-working power is now flowing. And the Holy Spirit's presence descends on them who ask in faith believing. Lord, I thank you. Somebody, there's a, an infection in the throat. Uh, it's been it's been around this time, just been very, very um, consistent. God's healing that right now. The swelling's going down. You're going to find things turning back to normal. I thank you, Lord. Arthritis been healed. Somebody just been healed of arthritis. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. You are the miracle worker. We give you the glory, Lord. So just keep praying right now. God's doing something special here today. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. Uh, somebody with a, a problem with your foot, you broke it. 
and there's there's some complications that are happening with it but God's healing you right now go go to your doctor have him check you. you're gonna find God's done something in your body Lord I thank you Lord we love you Jesus precious name we pray Lord and those who are believing for breakthrough in all other areas I pray by joining my faith with theirs that they would step into the miraculous Lord we thank you father that you're faithful and that you're good in Jesus name we pray and I want you to say it amen well I want to take this moment now to welcome the new members of Spirit Church I'm sure you love you guys as I always tell you we love you we are praying for you we want God's best for you so stay involved keep connected respond to the emails participate in the discussions and I would sure love to speak with you sometime, so try to set that up through the ministry. Just respond to a Spirit Church email, um, and, and the office will set that up for you. So we want to welcome you, now being a part of the Spirit family. And as usual, if this is considered your church and Spirit Church is your home, now is the time to now pay your tithes and offering. Also, those of you who watch our YouTube channel, Encounter TV, and experience the touch of God through many of our other ministries, you may not be a part of the Spirit family, but you are a partner or you are a supporter or you're someone who enjoys what we're doing. If you've been blessed in any way, consider right now today doing a one-time gift or a monthly donation. Some of you can do five, ten, twenty dollars. Some of you could do a hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. Do what you can today. I know God will bless you for it and it will help to spread the gospel all around the world. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. And it's actually the last one of 2015. And so we're going to start the new year 2016 off with some fresh teaching. I will not be sending you a teaching on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. I got a miracle service on New Year's Eve for those of you who are in Northern California. And on Christmas Eve, go and enjoy time with your family. Be with them. And just thank the Lord for what He's given us. So until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. I'll see you next year. So demons cause sickness, but not all sickness is demonic. Jesus, Jesus, now.